Chapter 32. The reader must now allow us to take him to the wall surrounding Monsieur de Villefort's house, where we shall meet some people with whom we are already acquainted. Maximilian Morel was the first to arrive at the grilled iron gate, where he stood looking for a shadow among the trees of the garden and listening for the sound of a silken slipper on the sand of the path. He finally heard the awaited footsteps, but he saw two shadows approaching instead of one. Valentine had been delayed by a visit from Madame Danglars and Eugenie, which had lasted longer than she expected. In order not to miss her rendezvous, Valentine had decided to invite Eugenie to take a stroll with her in the garden, which would enable Maximilian to see for himself that the delay was unavoidable. The young man understood everything with the rapid intuition of a lover and felt greatly relieved. After half an hour of strolling, the two young ladies walked back toward the house, leading Maximilian to suppose that Eugenie's visit was about to come to an end. Several moments later, Valentine reappeared alone. However, for fear that indiscreet eyes might be following her return, she walked slowly, and instead of going directly to the grill, she sat down on a bench after inconspicuously examining every clump of trees in the garden and glancing down every pathway. Then, when she had taken all these precautions, she ran over to the grill. "'Hello, Valentine,' said a voice. "'Hello, Maximilian. I kept you waiting, but you saw the reason, didn't you?' "'Yes, I recognize Mademoiselle Danglars. I didn't know you two were such close friends.' Who told you we were close friends? No one, but the way you were talking and walking with each other made me think so. You looked like two schoolgirls exchanging secrets. We were exchanging secrets, as a matter of fact, said Valentine. She was telling me how she detested the idea of marrying Albert de Morcerf, and I was telling her how unhappy I was at the thought of marrying Franz d'Epinay. As I talked to her about the man I can never love, I was thinking of the man I'll always love. Does Mademoiselle Danglars also love someone else? asked Maximilian. She says she doesn't, but that she has a horror of getting married. She says she'd give anything to be able to lead a free and independent life and that she almost wishes her father would lose his fortune so she could become an artist like her friend Louise de Armely. But let's not waste our time talking about her. We only have 10 more minutes together. What's wrong, Valentine? Why do you leave me so soon? Madame de Villefort has asked me to come see her. She says she has something to tell me which may affect part of my fortune. But as far as I'm concerned, they can take my fortune. I'm too rich. Then maybe they'll leave me alone. You'd love me just as much as if I were poor, wouldn't you, Maximilian? You know I'll always love you. What would I care about wealth or poverty as long as my Valentine was by my side and I was sure no one would ever take her away from me? But aren't you afraid your stepmother's message may be about your marriage? I don't think so. In any case, don't be afraid, Valentine. I'll never belong to another woman as long as I live. Do you think that makes me happy to hear that, Maximilian? Forgive me. It was thoughtless of me. What I started to tell you is that I saw Albert de Morcerf the other day, and he told me Franz has written to him saying he'll be back in Paris soon. Valentine turned pale and leaned, leaned against the gate for support. Can that be what Madame de Villefort wants to tell me? She cried, but no, she wouldn't be the one to tell me. Why not? Because I'm not sure, but even though she's never opposed my marriage openly, I still think she's not in favor of it. Really? In that case, I'm very fond of Madame de Villefort. If she's against your marrying Franz, then maybe you can break off the engagement and she'll be willing to listen to another proposal. Don't pin your hopes on that, Maximilian. It's not the husband my stepmother objects to, but marriage itself. What do you mean? If she's so opposed to marriage, why did she get married herself? You don't understand, Maximilian. As I told you, I'm too rich. I have an income of nearly 50,000 francs from my mother. My grandparents, the Marquis and Marquise of St. Moran, will leave me the same amount, and my other grandfather, Monsieur Nortier, has made it clear that he intends to leave everything he has to me. The result of all this is that my brother Edward has nothing to inherit from Madame de Villefort. He's poor. Madame de Villefort worships her son. Now, if, instead of marrying, I were to enter a convent, my whole fortune would go to my father, who would pass it on to Edward. It's strange to see such avarice in a young and beautiful woman. Don't forget that it's not for herself, but for her son. The avarice with which you reproach her is, from the standpoint of maternal love, almost a virtue. Why don't you simply give part of your fortune to her son? How could I make such a suggestion to a woman who's constantly talking about her disinterestedness? Listen, someone's calling me. Oh, Valentine, said Maximilian, put your little finger through the grill and let me kiss it. Would that make you happy? Oh, yes. Valentine stood up on a bench and put not her little finger, but her whole hand through the opening. Maximilian seized the beloved hand and ardently pressed his lips to it, but it slipped away from him almost instantly, and he heard Valentine running toward the house, frightened, perhaps, by her own sensations. Chapter 33 After the departure of Madame Danglars and her daughter, while Valentine was in the garden speaking with Maximilian, Monsieur de Villefort and his wife went to the room of Monsieur de Villefort's father. 
after dismissing Berois, an old servant who had been in Monsieur Nortier's service for more than 25 years, they sat down on either side of him. Monsieur Nortier was seated in his wheelchair, which he was placed in the morning and from which he was lifted at night. Sight and hearing were the only senses which, like two sparks, still animated that physical body already so close to the grave. As often happens when one organ is used to the exclusion of others, in his eyes were concentrated all the energy, strength, and intelligence which had formerly been distributed throughout his body and mind. He commanded with his eyes. He thanked with his eyes, and it was almost frightening to see them flashing with anger or sparkling with joy in that otherwise stony face. Only three persons were able to understand his language, Villefort, Valentine, and his old servant, Berois. But since Villefort saw his father only when absolutely necessary, all the old man's happiness lay in his granddaughter. And through devotion, patience, and love, Valentine had, had come to be able to read all his thoughts in his eyes. Father, said Villefort, the reason we dismissed Berois and didn't bring Valentine with us is that Madame de Villefort and I have something to tell you which can't be discussed before a young girl or a servant. We're sure that what we have to tell you will please you. The old man's eyes remained expressionless. Father, Valentine is to be married three months from now. We're sure you would be interested in the news, said Madame de Villefort, since Valentine has always seemed to have a special place in your heart. The young man we've chosen for her has a sizable fortune and an honorable name, and his conduct and tastes are such as to guarantee her happiness. Furthermore, his name is probably not unknown to you. He's the Monsieur Franz de Quesnel, Baron of Epinay. When Madame de Villefort pronounced this name, Nortier's eyelids fluttered like lips trying to speak and released a flash of lightning. Villefort, who knew of the political enmity which had once existed between his father and Franz's father, understood this agitation quite well, but he pretended not to notice it and said, we haven't forgotten you in the arrangements, father. We've made sure that since Valentine returns your deep affection for her, her new husband will agree to have you come and live with them so that you will have two children to look after you instead of one. Something frightful was taking place in the old man's soul. A cry of pain and rage must have risen in his throat and unable to burst forth choked him for his face had turned almost purple. Monsieur de Epinay and his family are also pleased with the marriage, said Madame de Villefort. His family, by the way, consists only of an uncle and an aunt. His mother died in giving birth to him and his father was assassinated in 1815. A mysterious assassination out of Villefort, whose authors have never been discovered, although suspicion has hung over a number of people. The real criminals would be lucky to be in our place, to have a daughter to offer to Monsieur Franz d'Epinay in order to allay the last shadow of suspicion. Nortier had mastered his feelings with a strength whose existence one would not have suspected in that shattered frame. Yes, I understand, his eyes said to Villefort, and his look expressed both profound scorn and intelligent anger. Villefort clearly understood this look and answered it with a slight shrug. Then he motioned to his wife to stand up. We must go now, said Madame de Villefort. And shall I send Edward to pay his respects to you? It had been arranged that the old man would express assent by closing his eyes, refusal by blinking them several times, and a desire for something by looking up at the ceiling. If he wanted to see Valentine, he would close his right eye only. If he wanted Berois, he would close his left eye. At Madame de Villefort's suggestion, he blinked his eyes energetically. She bit her lips in the face of this obvious refusal and asked, Shall I send Valentine then? Yes, said the old man by closing his eyes instantly. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort bowed and left the room. Valentine entered a few moments later. Her first glance at her grandfather told her how much he was suffering and how much he had to tell her. Oh, grandfather, she cried. What's happened? You're angry about something, aren't you? Yes, he said by closing his eyes. With whom are you angry? Is it my father? No. My stepmother? No. Are you angry with me? Nortier closed his eyes. You're angry with me? cried Valentine, astonished. I haven't seen you all day. Did someone tell you something about me? Yes. Let's see now. Let me think. Monsieur and Madame de Villefort just left here, so it must have been they who told you something that made you angry. Do you want me to go ask them what it was so I can apologize to you? No. What could they have told you? I have it, she said, lowering her voice and coming closer. Did they talk to you about my marriage? Yes, replied the old man's eyes angrily. Are you afraid I'll abandon you, grandfather, that my marriage will make me forget you? No. Then they told you Monsieur d'Epinay has agreed to have you live with us. Yes. Then why are you angry? The old man's eyes took on, a, on an expression of infinite tenderness. I understand, said Valentine. It's because you love me and you're afraid I'll be unhappy. Isn't that right? 
Yes. You don't like Monsieur d'Epinay? No, 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 replete, repeated Nortier's eyes. Listen, said Valentine, kneeling before him and putting her arm around his neck. I don't like Monsieur d'Epinay either. A sparkle of joy appeared in his eye. Oh, if only you could help me break off the marriage, continued Valentine. You would have been such a powerful protector for me before your misfortune, but now you can do nothing except understand me and share my happiness and sorrow. As she said this, there was such a deep look of cunning in Nortier's eyes that he seemed to read these that they seemed to read these words in them. You're wrong. I can still do much for you. Nortier looked up at the ceiling, a sign that he wanted something. What do you want, grandfather? asked Valentine. She began to recite the letters of the alphabet, stopping to watch his eyes at each letter. At N, he signaled yes. Ah, it begins with an N, said Valentine. All right, is it an A, an E, an I, an O? Yes, it begins with an O, said Valentine. Good. She went over and took out a dictionary, opened it before Nortier, and began to run her finger up and down the columns. At the word notary, she signaled her. he signaled her to stop. Is it the notary you want, grandfather? Yes. Do you want me to send for one right away? Yes. Is that all you want? Yes. Valentine rang and told a servant to go ask Monsieur and Madame de Villefort to come to Monsieur Nortier's room. Monsieur de Villefort entered, led by Barrois. My grandfather wants to see a notary, said Valentine. But why do you need a notary? asked Villefort. If Monsieur Nortier asks for a notary, it's obviously because he needs one, said Barrois, who acknowledged no other master than Nortier, and I'll therefore go and bring one. You shall have a notary if you insist, said Villefort to Nortier, but I'll apologize to him for you, for both you and myself, because it will make an extremely ridiculous scene. Just the same, said Berrois. I'm going to go bring one. And the old servant walked triumphantly out of the room. Villefort sat down and waited. Nortier watched him with complete indifference, but out of the corner of his eye, he had ordered Valentine to remain also. Three quarters of an hour later, Berrois returned with a notary. You have been sent for Mon by Monsieur Nortier de Villefort here said Villefort after the first exchange of greetings with the notary. His paralysis has deprived him of the use of his limbs and his voice. It's hard for us even to grasp a few scraps of his thoughts. Nortier appealed to Valentine with his eyes, an appeal so serious and imperative that she immediately said to the notary, I understand everything my grandfather wishes to say. It's true, added Berrois. Everything, absolutely everything, as I told you on the way here. Monsieur Nortier closes his eyes when he wishes to say yes and blinks them several times when he wishes to say no, said Valentine. And however difficult it may seem to you to discover his thoughts, I'll demonstrate it to you in such a way that you'll have no doubts on this subject. Very well, then, said the notary. Let's try it. Do you accept this young lady as your interpreter, Monsieur Nortier? Yes, signaled the old man. Good. Now, why did you send for me? Valentine named all the letters of the alphabet until she came to W, where Nortier's eloquent eyes stopped her. Then she began to ask him, W-A, W-E, W-I. He stopped right at the third syllable. When he... She opened the dictionary under the notary's attentive eyes. Will, said her finger, stopped by Nortier's eyes. Will, exclaimed the notary. Monsieur Nortier wants to make his will. It's quite clear. Yes, signaled Nortier several times. This is marvelous, said the notary to an amazed Villefort. Yes, but I think the will would be still more marvelous, said Villefort. The words won't put themselves on paper without my daughter's inspiration, and I'm afraid she's too interested a party to be a suitable interpreter of Monsieur Nortier's obscure wishes. No, no, signaled the old man. What? exclaimed Villefort. Valentine is not an interested party in your will. No. Monsieur de Villefort, said the notary, who was looking forward to relating this picturesque episode to his friends. Nothing now seems easier to me than what I regarded as impossible only a few minutes ago. This will be valid will, a valid will if, according to the law, it is read in the presence of seven witnesses approved by the testator and sealed by a notary in their presence. Furthermore, in order to make it completely inc incontestable, one of my colleagues will assist me in contrary contrary to custom, be present at the dictation of the will. Is that satisfactory to you, Monsieur Nortier? Yes, replied Nortier, delighted at having been understood. Berrois, who had heard everything and anticipated his master's wishes, was already on his way to bring the second notary. Villefort sent for his wife. A quarter of an hour later, everyone was gathered in Nortier's room, and the second notary had arrived. The first notary said to Nortier, have you some idea of the amount of your fortune? Yes. I'm now going to name several figures in ascending order. You will stop me when I reach the figure which you believe to represent the amount of your fortune. It is more than 300,000 francs, isn't it? Yes, signaled Nortier. Do you possess 400,000 francs? Nortier's eyes remain motionless. 500,000, six, seven, eight, nine. Nortier closed his eyes. You possess 900,000 francs. Yes. And to whom do you wish to leave this fortune? To Mademoiselle Valentine de Villefort. Nortier blinked his eyes in the most meaningful manner. Are you sure you're not mistaken? asked the notary, surprised. No, repeated Nortier. No. 
Valentine was overwhelmed, not at having been excluded from his will, but at having provoked the sentiments which usually dictate such an act. But Nordier looked at her with such a profound expression of tenderness that she cried out, Oh, I see, grandfather. It's only your fortune you've taken away from me, but you still leave me your love. Yes, yes, certainly, said Nordier's eyes with an expression that left no doubt in Valentine's mind. Meanwhile, this refusal had brought unexpected hope to Madame de Villefort. She approached the old man and asked, Is it to your grandson, Edward, that you leave your fortune then? His eyes blinked in a terrible way, which they almost expressed hatred. Is it to your son, Monsieur de Villefort? asked the notary. No. The two notaries looked at each other in bewilderment. Villefort and his wife flushed, one from shame, the other from anger. But what have we done to you, grandfather? asked Valentine. Nordier fixed his gaze on her hand. My hand, she asked. Yes. Oh, you see how useless it is, gentlemen, said Villefort. My poor father is mad. Oh, cried Villa Valentine suddenly. I understand. It's my marriage, isn't it, grandfather? Yes, yes, yes. You're angry at us for marriage, aren't you? Yes. You don't want me to marry Monsieur Franci Ebene, do you? No. Are you disinheriting your granddaughter because she's about to marry against your wishes? Asked the notary. Yes. And what you do in... What do you intend to do with your fortune if Mademoiselle de Villefort marries Monsieur d'Epinay? Will you leave it to some other member of your family? No. Will you leave it to the poor then? Yes. What is your decision of this in view of this, Monsieur de Villefort? Asked the notary. Nothing. I know that my father never changes his mind, so I'll simply resign myself. His 900,000 francs will leave the family, but I will not yield to an old man's whim, and I will continue to act according to my conscience. Villefort withdrew with his wife, leaving his father to make out his will as he saw fit.